What's going on guys? Jake here from Churchfront along with James Attaway from Attaway Audio. Check out his YouTube channel and all the resources that he has down below in the description of this video. And I thought it would be fun since I had James here. This is a very seasoned mix engineer. You served for what, almost 12 years at International House of Prayer? Yeah. Right? Very skilled, knowledgeable, all the things, but also just a very fun guy. I, I want to encourage you to check out his YouTube channel. He, he just has some amazing content and he delivers it uh, in just a really fun way. How many times have you seen in comments, uh, people are like, that guy reminds me from uh, of, of Ross from Friends. Ross from Friends, Ray Romano. Yeah, or Ray Romano. Most, yeah. Yep, yep. And then, then for me, nobody, at least in the States, even knows this guy, but Harry Kane is a um, football player, or soccer soccer player in uh, England. I get that one all the time. But So you got uh, Ray Romano and Harry Kane bringing you some auto audio tips today. So what I wanted to do in this video is have James share with myself as well as you guys the, the tweaks that he made to our mix here at South Fellowship to take our mix from what I would consider good, uh, maybe, I don't hope, hope you considered it good, yeah. uh, to, to great, right? Because it, it's really fun to have a fresh set of ears, um, especially someone with the experience that James has. And I want him to, to come in working with the show file we already had built on this wing and just kind of start taking things to the next level. Um, so let's just go ahead and, and dive on in, James. Tell us kind of the first thing uh, you noticed this morning. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, Everybody wants to start sound checking the drums and the vocals are usually up and working well enough. So I wasn't so concerned with that. And even walking in, stuff sounded good. I didn't have any glaring problems where I was like, uh-oh, we gotta do surgery here. And as a guest coming in, you know, you wanna respect the house, you wanna be uh, mindful of what's already working here. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I'm also trying to feel out what's worked for them in the past and they're getting dialed in with their overall levels. They're getting dialed in with, you know, what feels good for their room. So uh, there's not a whole lot of stuff that I need to totally revamp. It's mostly just little tweaks that help take it up a notch. So sound checking the drums, that's one of the first things that I want to hear. I've never heard this drum kit. It's an electronic kit. I'm used to having acoustic drum kit. So I wanted to hear that and kind of get that dialed in. And also the drum kit is a great way to kind of test out the sound system to see from the very lowest frequencies to the very highest frequencies. Like what are you dealing with with the PA? How are you, how is it responding uh, both here at front of house and then also out in the room? Like what am I up against when I'm trying to mix? And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that the PA actually sounded really good. There weren't any huge hot spots or dead spots. There wasn't a ton of extra reverb. Uh, but on the kick drum, it was just lasting a little bit longer than I wanted it to. Uh, where is if I had an acoustic drum kit, I would have tried to find a pillow or a sweatshirt or something to dampen the heads on that drum. But it was just the patch that they had chosen uh, for that kick drum sound. And it was just ringing out a little bit longer than I wanted it to. So I didn't want to go and you know redo all their samples. So on the kick drum, I, uh, the EQ was a little flatter. Uh, maybe there was a little bit of boost up in the top end. But what I did is I went to the gate, and I rarely use gates. They're just really to get me out of a jam when I can't. And I made sure that the gate was working fast enough to just give me the punch of the kick drum and then stop it. So the hold was a little longer and the release was a little longer on that. And dialing that back to hold very short and then release made it stop a little bit sooner, and that helped the kick drum not to excite the low frequencies in the room quite as much. Um, it seemed like they wanted to hang on for a long time. So the shorter that I can make the low end on that kick drum, the less that the reverberant space is gonna be uh, dialed in there. Um, next thing I did on the kick drum was it looked about like this, where you know a little boost on the bottom end, maybe the, the high pass filter, the low cut was a little bit lower. And they're boosting some attack up in the, you know, the uh, fourth and highest bands. Uh, but one thing that I think really helps with a lot of drums is just cutting mid-range. So I go to 400, 500. I'm not super picky about which exact frequency this is. And I'm just going to pull it out a whole lot. And that's going to help me just get less floppiness out of the drums. Mm -hmm. uh, mid-range in drums can sound great in certain musical styles. But if you're doing anything that resembles rock music, you want to just dump mid-range out of drums as much as you can. Um, 
So that was pretty much what I did for the kick drum and then it, it sounded good. There were times in the set where I thought it needed to cut through a little bit more and get a little bit more snap. So I just boost these higher frequencies a little bit more. And again, two or three dB is gonna be plenty on here. The drum samples themselves sound good to start with. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't really a problem. Uh, on the snare drum, I think it was pretty flat to start again. And again, they're good sounding samples. Uh, but I think the high pass filter or low cut, please excuse me for using non Behringer terminology, uh, was a lot higher. So I brought that down so that I could get a little bit more oomph out of the snare drum. And then I brightened it up just a little bit, around 2.5K and 5K. That just helped the snap and the sizzle of the snare or what would have been the snare bottom or how they mixed it in for the sample. That just came through a little bit more and gave me a little bit more cut. So with those two things you know, in line and then later in the set, there were some more accents on the crash cymbals. And I'm used to just having overhead mics for all the cymbals and the drums together. So I didn't realize that over here, there was, there was a specific fader for just the crashes. Mm -hmm. So I got to ride that up at one point and that was really helpful to, mm -hmm. uh, to bring out those accents, right? So that the drums stay dynamic. One of the challenges with uh, electronic drum kits is the dynamics are more difficult. Mm -hmm. Drummers have a hard time playing light enough to excite the triggers, but not so heavy that it makes a sound that's louder than what they want to do at that point. So, uh, so really managing the dynamics on those drums was the, the whole idea for um, taking those up to the next level. Uh, the next thing that I went to was on the vocals. Um, I've got a four-step process for EQing vocals that's worked for literally hundreds of different singers, and it's helped me get them dialed in quickly and it's not so much a formula that I do exactly this much at exactly these frequencies, but it, they're more principles where they're gonna work on most vocal mics with most singers. Mm -hmm. um, with some of the feedback that we got after the service, right, uh, I found out that it may be a little bit duller here at front of house than it is down there uh, in the seats. So some of the older people in the congregation had some comments that the vocal was too loud and too bright or maybe a little bit too thin. Um, but here's my four step process, is I go ahead and put the low cut filter somewhere between 125 to 150 for male vocals. And then for female vocals, usually 150 to 200. In that range, that's gonna get rid of your pops and your plosives, the things that are really going to uh, create bigger problems in your mix. From there, I take my low band and I go to a low shelf and I'm pulling out somewhere around 200, right? Um, this is getting rid of the proximity effect. Um, now, you could actually leave this alone, put this all the way back up, and roll up your low cut or high pass filter even higher. And that can be a fast way to get clean vocals and be able to move on to something else because muddy vocals just take all the energy out of a mix. Yeah. Nobody wants to sing along when they can't understand what's being sung. Um, so, yeah, is it the most precise way to get clear vocals? No, mm -hmm. but it's gonna get it fast. And one thing that people forget about a high low cut filter or a high pass filter is it's not the fact that you're taking out everything right below that frequency, right? So if you set your, uh, your high pass filter at 263 hertz, it's not like there's nothing now at 250 or 220. So you think about you know, people and the fundamental frequency of what they're singing. If they're singing in the octave below middle C, so somewhere between uh, two th or 130 and 260, right? That's where the fundamental note is. Mm -hmm. Even if you've got your low cut filter at 250 hertz, that's just turning down the octave below that by maybe 12, sometimes 24 dB, but it's not like it's totally gone. Mm -hmm. We've just turned it down that much. I made a video a few months ago about processing a, a worship leader vocal, and man, look at the comment section of that video. We'll probably get some today as well, of course, as, as always. Leave a comment, uh, whether you have a good or a poor opinion. Um, and, and, but, but the comments that came up were like, man, Jake, you're being so aggressive with that high pass or low filter or the low cut. Because I would, yeah, I'd, I'd bring it up to like, on my own voice, I like the sound of it all the way up to 280. Um, but I really appreciate the trick that you have where you're using both a combination of a, a lower high pass um, frequency and then using that low shelf to continue to get rid of that plosive effect. Yeah, 
And really, if you take a look at the frequency response of, say, a Sure Beta 87 or an SM58, they will actually show you in their documentation the difference of the frequency response when you're two feet away and then when you're two inches away. And if you look at that, there is a huge boost in the low end starting around 500 and going up six, seven, eight dB. Wow. So even to get things back to sounding normal, sometimes you have to be really aggressive with your vocal EQ to pull that out and to make it feel like it's natural again. So it's really one of those tricks that once you learn how to do it and once you dial it in, you'll never go back to not cutting out that low end on your vocal mics. Um, now there are caveats where there are vocal mics that have less of this proximity effect, uh, so, like some of your Heil mics. Uh, the, you know, you know, if you're really trendy and you're doing the EV RE20 for your lead vocal mic, those are ported in a way that they don't have as much proximity effect, so you don't have to pull out on that low end. But for most other vocal mics, they're gonna do that, and this trick is gonna really, I don't wanna say revolutionize, but it's really gonna change the way that you mix vocals, mm -hmm. and you'll have those aha moments uh, when you try pulling out more of that low end. Uh, so let's return this to my normal setting, you know, not my help, I'm, you know, I'm in a hurry setting. And we'll turn that down. If, now, if we looked at the low shelf without the high pass filter, that's about what it, it looked like. Mm -hmm. But with the high pass filter that high, it makes the lines look kind of blurred. So it's, it's less obvious exactly what you're doing. Um, the next thing that I do is on, I use band, I'm using band three on this one. I don't know why they're out of order. But there's usually a low mid resonance that I'll take out around 500 hertz. Yeah. And this goes from feeling kind of covered to uncovered all of a sudden. And when you find the right frequency for each singer, it's, it's like you've taken another step toward really clear vocals. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's a 500, sometimes it's a 400, sometimes it's a 600. And I was able to find it on Aaron, the worship leader today, uh, right around 543 hertz. So uh, finding that frequency, it kind of comes uncovered and it's really helpful. Uh, up in the upper mids, uh, you've probably heard when a singer goes from singing low and they're really dark and covered to singing high and loud, and then all of a sudden it's harsh, right? We can try to pick a very selective frequency in the upper mids to pull that out so that it's a lot more pleasing when they're really pushing and going for it. Uh, a little bit goes a long way, and keeping your, narrow, your cuts narrow uh, helps it so that you don't lose the presence of the vocal. If I cut too much of this and made it too wide, it would lose the presence. It would feel like it's far away and not up close anymore. And that disconnects the people in the congregation from the worship leader there. So you've got to watch out for that. Don't go too crazy with that high mid cut. Um, and then things pretty much felt right, except... Maybe if I was going to run sound at this church again, I would cut maybe a little bit less on this low shelf and warm things up just a little bit more, knowing that it's a little bit duller here than it is out in the seats. Now show them what you did with compression, because I think that when it comes to the vocal mic, that was yeah. the next significant uh, adjustment that you made, where, I, so if I were to sum up the changes that you make, um, here I'll pull up our red compressor. Um, I think we were, we had it set so you're getting about maybe five decibels of gain reduction on the channel level, and then we have a, a vocal bus with a LA on it. Um, that was getting maybe another five or so decibels. So yeah. in total, you're getting like almost 10 to 12 decibels of gain reduction. So how did, how did you change it? Why did you change it? Um, I like the results, but talk yeah. through what you, why you did what you did. So I like to ride the vocal levels a lot. So I would rather compress my input channels more and ride the levels as the dynamics go up and down with the band mm -hmm. so that I'm always on that vocal channel and I'm making sure that they're just in front of the band, that they're always clear. You know, if the singer backs off the mic some or they start singing quieter because they get something stuck in their throat, I'm there and ready to go to keep that vocal out in front the entire time. So I actually compress my input channels a little heavier and if I'm running through buses, I'll have my buses do a lot lighter compression. Mm -hmm. So here on the red compressor, I choose a ratio of, a, of four to one it's kind of hard to mess up a compressor if you're at four to one, unless you just go with way too much gain reduction and you're pulling down the threshold too far. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good middle of the road ratio. If you don't really know what you're doing with it, just go for that and it's gonna be okay. Um, 
The attack and the release time, I go for about 10 to 15 milliseconds on the attack and about 250 milliseconds on the release. This just works for the speed of a lot of the worship songs that we're singing. Mm -hmm. So the, ly the lyrics and the syllables aren't coming out super fast like they might if there was rap or with like a spoken word uh, like your preacher, you might need that release time a little bit faster. But 250 milliseconds has just proven itself over a lot of different tempos and a lot of different singers. Uh, then I ride my threshold down until I'm getting about maybe 5 dB of compression max during the verses. And I'm hitting sometimes 10, maybe 12 in a really big chorus uh, when the vocalists are really pushing hard. Mm -hmm. um, now, one thing that I ran into today was the worship leader sang at one level during sound check. And then when there were people in here to actually lead, he started singing much louder. So then I, I could see that with my compressor and that my gain reduction meter was going crazy. And so then I was able to easily identify that problem and ride the threshold up a little bit more so that I didn't have so much compression and I wasn't getting those artifacts that can come by having too much gain reduction and too little dynamic range left in your vocals. Uh, the other thing that you have to look out for when you're running that much gain reduction is that you're going to be tempted to ride your fader up to make up for the gain. But after you get to plus five or so on your fader, you're getting less and less fine tuning ability. Or even if they you know, back off the mic or things get quiet and you need to push it up more, you're running out of room at that point. So turning up the makeup gain on the output of the compressor will allow you to bring your fader back down closer to zero or sometimes negative five if it's a quieter section. Or if you're doing it on a background vocal where you know they're singing background now, Later, they're going to be singing a lead part, and you need that extra room to put them out in front of the mix. Awesome. What's yeah. next? All right. So the next thing that I took a, le a look at was acoustic guitar. And if we look at the EQ first, uh, I think the guitar EQ was kind of flat. I don't remember a whole lot of changes. Uh, they did have the high cut down a little bit lower. And that can be especially helpful if you've got a cheaper sounding guitar. If there's too much 10K in your guitar, it sounds like you got it at Walmart. Now, if you did get your guitar at Walmart, no offense to you, but it's not the most expensive, most warm sounding guitar that you're gonna get. So- Well, he, oh, did, he did have a Martin, so okay. that's why I had to mix it that yeah. way. <laughs> so the, the first thing that I'm gonna look at on any input, and especially guitars, is the high pass filter. Anytime you can get rid of any subharmonic information, that's gonna clean up the rest of your mix and make it a lot easier for other things to come through clearly. It makes room for the bass, but I don't want to take it up so far that it sounds thin when he's playing by himself, because very often worship leaders are playing by themselves to accompany themselves. And you don't want to go too thin at that point, uh, even if it fits well in the rest of the mix when the rest of the band is in. So my go-to spot for the low cut filter, I'll start at 82, but I can go all the way up to 150, and that's no problem. There's usually plenty of low end, or at least perceived low end, even when you have that uh, high pass filter on. Now, from EQing a bunch of guitars, there tend to be three different problem spots that will resonate, and that's basically just because of the size and the shape of the guitar. They tend to resonate right at these same spots, whether it's a Martin, whether it's a Taylor or a Yamaha. It tends to be around here. And so I'll go in octaves because if you understand the overtone series and harmonics, things that resonate will also resonate the octave up from that and two octaves up from it. So if you start at 315 hertz and just pull out a little bit there, you can use a pretty narrow cut uh, and you don't even have to go very far. And then also pull down 630, one octave from up from that and uh, 1.2K, again, another octave up from that. And that tends to just clean up the guitar. If you're wondering, you know, like, is this really for real? Is this really doing anything? You can pull those down and then just turn off the EQ and say, do I like this better or not? And you don't necessarily have to do this and you don't necessarily have to do any or all of these frequencies, but these are my go-to spots that I'm checking for. And today I got a lot of compliments on how the guitar sounded. Um, now, one other thing is that sometimes if you've got a guitar with older strings or they haven't been changed in a while, they'll oxidize and they'll get a little bit duller. So today I did a wide boost, uh, right around but somewhere between 2 and 5K. 
And another rule that I use for EQ is you always, where you can tend to cut narrow, but always boost wide. That's gonna give you the most natural musical sounding EQ. Uh, when you boost very narrow, it'll jump out to your ear and it, it, your ear and your brain will say, hey, something's not right there or something's out of balance here if you have a narrow cut or excuse me, a narrow boost uh, on any one of the frequencies, your brain will identify that as a, like a mismatch in all the overtones mm. uh, and identify it. So anytime you're boosting, go wide, and that's gonna be really helpful. And that really helped. Do you wanna yeah. um, hit play and we'll check it out? I'm not afraid. So if we bypass it, it's not a bad sounding acoustic guitar, but I get a whole lot more clarity out of it when I turn on the EQ. Now without that boost, that's okay, but if I wanna pull it back in the mix a little bit more compared to the pianos and the other guitars, now that little bit of a boost helps it stand out just a little bit more. Another thing that I'm looking for in the acoustic guitar is I'm trying to make sure that it's mixed on the fader in relation to something else so that it's not just off by itself. I'm listening to things like the hi-hat or the ride cymbal to make sure that rhythmically they're complementing one another. I'm listening to the other uh, mid-range instruments like the, guitar, like the electric guitar, like the piano, just to make sure that they're in the same ballpark so that they're fitting, right? One isn't way out in front of the rest and uh, so they're really complementing one another as part of the arrangement. So after we do acoustic guitar, the next logical thing to do is the electric guitar because they have to work together. So a lot of times uh, they could clash if they're playing in the same range at the same time. Uh, so we've got another trick to making sure that they're both sounding good on their own, but also sounding good with one another. And that same overtone series tends to build up on electric guitars as well. So. Uh, to keep them separate, I'll actually leave 315 hertz alone on electric guitars very often. Again, I'm gonna roll up my high pass filter to about 150 hertz if I've got a bass player uh, because I just wanna leave a lot of room for the bass to feel really big. And one of the things I say on my channel all the time is that it's all about the low end. When you get that right, everything else falls into place. And so making enough room for your bass guitar to have its space uh, by rolling up the high pass filter on some other instruments really lets that bass do its job in filling up the bottom end, adding sustain, and being that foundation of your mix. So with the electric guitar, we've rolled up the high pass filter, and I'm gonna go to 615 hertz and pull out a little bit. Uh, but especially if you have older electric guitar players, sometimes they have lost a little bit of their hearing in the upper mids. Mm. And to compensate with, for that, they will make their guitar uh, unnaturally bright for other people, but that can tend to be painful for others. Mm -hmm. So my safety first frequency on electric guitar is 3.15K. 3 so I'll go up here and just notch that out a little bit. It doesn't have to be much. And I might put it back in if I find that the guitar isn't super bright, but if it's gonna cut and it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt right there and it's gonna hurt in a hurry. So if you wanna be able to turn it up, if you wanna be able to have it in front of the mix when it's taking over the melody roll, cutting that a little bit is gonna be super helpful for you. The other thing to know about electric guitar is that so much can change when they 
switch pickups, when they switch pedals. So you kind of have to be able to roll with it and roll with the punches whenever they're going to change their tone or what they're sending to you. But these tips are kind of middle of the road. We're not uh, adding or subtracting very much. We're just trying to take care of little things that are going to help it feel a little bit more polished in the rest of the mix. Mm -hmm. uh, when it gets to keyboards, often when you have a keyboard player that usually uh, accompanies themselves, they're going to tend to play a darker piano sound and they're going to tend to play lower on the keyboard. So it's, uh, their, their notes are uh, more in the low mids because they want to accompany themselves and feel full. Right? That doesn't always work when you've got electric guitars, drums, and bass with it as well. So a lot of times I will roll up the high pass filter to clean it up and then I'll cut it two different frequencies in the low mids right around 220 hertz and right around 440 hertz. Mm -hmm. This helps uh, clean up some of the overtones from the notes that they're playing, uh, either the notes that they're playing or the overtones of the notes where they're playing, and it just cleans it up a little bit. After that, if that's still not enough to keep it cutting through the mix, you can add a high shelf to add that sound of the hammer hitting the strings, and it just makes it cut through the mix very briefly, but you, your ear grabs onto that and says, aha, there's a piano, even though you don't have to have it out in front or taking up all that sonic space that's going to compete with the vocals. So one of the linchpins in your mix is the bass guitar, because it's really connecting the low end of the kick drum and the drums to the rest of the rhythm instruments. So the way that we EQ the bass guitar really helps form the bridge between those two parts of the band. A lot of times with less experienced bass players, they'll send you way too much low end. So I'm not afraid to use the low cut filter or the high pass filter on the bass because they might be sending me way more than I need. Now the lowest note on the bass is around 41 hertz. So I'm gonna set my high pass filter there to start and I might need to set it even higher after that. Next, I'm gonna see if I need to use a low shelf to pull out some of those lower uh, sub-low frequencies. And it gets a little more uh, fine tuning than what the low cut filter is gonna do. So I can really fine tune which frequencies and by how much I wanna pull out of the low end. Now, the trick to getting a big bass is not necessarily having all those sub lows, but tricking your ear into thinking that it sounds bigger than it is. So to borrow a trick from old country music where the big upright bass sounds really big and full is to boost around 200 hertz. And again, when we're boosting, we're boosting wide. So that's gonna warm up the bass and it tricks your ear into thinking that the overtones are a lot uh, larger than they are on the low end. Now, if it still needs to cut a little bit more, uh, a lot of church bass players are less experienced uh, and don't have any drive or distortion pedals to kind of give those extra overtones that help the bass cut through. So sometimes I'll boost right around four or 500 hertz. And again, a wide boost is helpful and that gives it a little bit more growl. Uh, again, if they're less experienced and you're getting a lot of noise or fret clang, the low cut, can uh, definitely help. So if I go over here to the, or excuse me, the high cut can help. Uh, and I'll roll that down all the way to 2K because there's nothing really above that point that I need unless they're playing slap and pop and then you have other problems. Um, on the bass, the compressor is also really important. So if I go over here to the red compressor, um, again, we're at five to one. That was a setting that was here, but it wasn't bothering me. I usually set it around four to one. Uh, our attack, I slowed down. The attack time on here was I think around five or six milliseconds to start. And I'll show you what that sounds like and then I'll move it to uh, around 18 or 20 milliseconds and let you hear the difference of what happens when we slow that attack time down on a low frequency instrument like the bass.
Now you can't feel the subs where you are, but if you could, you would feel that the bass got a lot bigger. It felt like it went down an octave when we turned our attack time slower to around 20 milliseconds. So if you're not getting all the bass that you want out of your bass guitar, it might be that the attack time is too fast on your compressor. The last thing that I really wanted to dial in and something that I just like doing when I'm mixing is getting the delay on the vocals just right. And for me, that includes not just tapping it in, you know, we've got our handy tap tempo button where I'm tapping in either the eighth note or the quarter note so that I can get it timed to the music and then ride up the fader in the appropriate spot where it needs a little bit more sustain or I want some lyric to repeat a little bit more. Uh, and that's really getting the EQ just right where I'm using my high cut and low cut filters to shape the space that the delay is sitting in. So here on the delay unit itself, uh, before it, there's some EQ, but even if you didn't want to do that, on the delay, there's the high cut and low cut filters. And I will always at least roll my low cut filter or high pass filter up to 200. Sometimes I'll go all the way up to 400. Uh, and that gives a nice thin delay that's not going to compete with my vocals. I'm not going to feel like it's cluttering up in my mix, but it just kind of feels like it's right there and might maybe that kind of telephone type sound. On the high cut, anytime you have S's and T's repeating, they're going to jump out and call attention to the listener. So when you're able to cut out those S's and T's and those higher frequencies, it gives you more of a sense of depth, like something's a little bit further away or pushed back in the mix. So you can add that time element without drawing attention to yourself. And those are really the things that I did to take what they had as a good mix and just take it up a notch uh, to what, you know, partially what my preferences are, but then also what has worked for a lot of other people as well. Yeah, I really appreciated these tweaks that you made. Um, again, wasn't anything massive. Uh, we were able to, I mean, one thing we strive for here is just ca capturing high quality audio at the source too. That's why a lot of our EQs were not doing a whole lot of like cutting and boosting to the to an extreme level but i really appreciate some of the tricks that you showed there whether it was um even with with the kick drum getting that electric kick to sound better um with that i agree it definitely has some like it's more sustained than i wanted it sounded a little bit bigger than i wanted um and then also even just accentuating um some of the 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 eq on the the vocal delay bus that you just talked about there um yeah, guys, it's just so valuable to have a fresh pair of ears come in because myself, Adam, you know, we're here every Sunday. We're kind of dialing this in every week and um, training our volunteers on, on running this as well. And they're kind of helping us dial it in as well. But man, I highly encourage have someone outside your church um, who knows what they're doing come by um, and, and, and just to take a listen and, and give you some feedback on your mix that I just, it's really hard when you're just in it all the time to have that very objective uh, perspective on it. Yeah, especially with uh, the amount that you've had to put in to get your system to this level. I didn't have to come in and do any patching. I didn't do any setup of the stage. I didn't do, I didn't have to do all the stuff that you've probably already done at your church to get it where it is. And you've probably done a really good job. It can just be an extra set of ears that hasn't listened to that same drummer or that same worship leader or that same guitar player over and over again. Maybe they've got the trick up their sleeve that uh, has been the thing that's eluding you or you just thought, oh, I thought that was normal all the time. Now, maybe it's not normal and you have to check out something different or try new things. I mean, if you always do the same thing, you're gonna get the same results. And so to get better, you have to make some changes. And that can be scary when you don't know if that change is gonna make things a lot worse and then you're next on the line. So thanks so much, James, for your help this morning and for just running sound so I could take it easy this morning. <laughs> uh, Adam could take it easy as well. Um, where can folks go to, to learn more? Other uh, Your YouTube channel is an obvious place, but yeah. any other resources? Yeah, so I have a free guide for you called How to Lead your church sound team and it walks people through how to decide what's going to work for you and your sound team uh, you can find it through the link in the description below you can download it print it out and take it to your pastor and worship leader and say hey what are the values of our mix how do we know when we're winning and what skills do we need to look for when we're recruiting and bringing on new sound techs 
Thanks so much, man. That wraps up this video for you guys today. Please leave a like for all of the valuable info that was just dropped here um, from James. And uh, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future content, especially our future. Smash that like button. Yeah, see you guys next time. All right, bye.